everybody. I am so excited to get to talk to you guys this day. Um, I grew up in this community, so this is, this is kind of like coming home for me. I've been incredibly lucky to be able to work with DITRA, with USAMRID, with CDC, and with NIH. And this was through my graduate work, postdoc, and setting up my own laboratory uh, at MIT. So I used to attend these conferences way back in the day, and we're not going to talk about how long ago that was. <laughs> But uh, I, I've been here, and so I feel a little bit like this is, this is coming home for me. Um, I know that this conference has some of the smartest minds in our nation's chemical and biological defense, and so I was just thrilled to get the opportunity to come talk to you. Between working in biodefense and working at NASA in space exploration, I have always been struck by the similarities of the challenges that we face and the scientific and technological solutions that we developed to solve these challenges. I'd like to share a little bit with you about how we see science and technology evolving at NASA. How do we accelerate innovation? How do we deal with the challenges of an ever-increasing pace of technological change? And how do we harness innovation to address these sometimes seemingly impossible technical questions? We have some White House goals that are set out for us. Those are impossible. We need to go back to the moon, and we need to do it in the next few years. This seems almost impossible some days. So I'd like to talk about how we address innovation at NASA and how you might address innovation in your field of biodefense. So this story starts in a ridiculously small capsule, 150 feet up in the air, on top of a 676,000-pound rocket. There's not much that I can do at this point except to carefully consider my life choices <laughs> and wonder how it is that I've ended up here. It's too late to do anything about it. I am on top of what's essentially a controlled explosion, an ICBM, an incendiary, whatever. It's something that common sense says that humans should not sit on top of. But this is NASA, and like you, we do ridiculous things for a living. NASA is working at the absolute edge of the engineering envelope. Spaceflight is incredibly exciting because of what, we are, what we're doing to push the bleeding edge of science and technology. This is a forcing function for creativity. It's forcing creativity, innovation, and scientific progress. Space is also a harsh mistress. Mistakes are costly on a national and an international scale. You guys seeing some parallels here to with what you do? So we live in a world that's changing more rapidly than ever before. How do we accomplish our mission with what's possible right now? And how do we keep pace with that in the future? We have an imperative to stay ahead of the innovation curve for purposes of national defense and economic security. The systems that were designed to support science and technology research innovation a couple decades ago or even a decade ago are no longer enough in the age of AI and global connectivity. So how do we think outside the box to ensure that the United States retains its leadership position in science and technology? At NASA, there are several ways that we harness innovation to solve science and engineering problems. One of them is internal innovation. So as most of you know, innovation can be very difficult in a large government agency. Particularly at NASA, we're an engineering organization with large acquisition programs. These, this is not set up for innovation. So we've tackled some of these challenges in scientific exploration and tech de development by taking on these seemingly impossible problems. We focus on a specific problem we want to solve and temporarily completely ignore our current ways of thinking. We ignore the engineering designs developed for decades. We ignore the proven hardware so that we can approach these technical problems with a clean slate. The conversation often goes like this. We can't do that. Concur, absolutely, we can't do that. So how are we gonna do that? I recommend this approach. I'll talk about some specific breakthroughs where NASA has advanced methods and technology for biological experimentation in the extreme environment of space. Let's start with fluid mechanics in microgravity and cell culture. So in microgravity, water or really any other kind of fluid is absolutely fascinating. You wait till an astronaut gets on board the space station for the first time, they're gonna play with this for like a week or two. So it will form into a sphere 
and float suspended if not touching anything. It's really interesting as, as a scientific property, we can look at things like containerless vessels in fluid. There's no buoyancy-driven convection, so these incredibly delicate structures and cell cultures can be interrogated in ways we just simply cannot do on Earth. We've got our ever-present gra gravity field here. There's no way to switch it off. I do get asked this question, where at NASA do you have the anti-gravity room? We don't. <laughs> Gotta go to space for that. So this is incredibly interesting for human physiology at the cellular, the organismal level. If we could harness this area, we'd have the potential to build multicellular tissue. You can build up these delicate types of tissue for study without destroying the tissues. The cells no longer sink to the bottom of the culture plate. They're suspended. However, once something touches the, the fluid, the forces of adhesion and surface tension take over. So fluid's gonna wick up the side of the cell culture plate and could be released in tiny droplets in the air. Which leads me to, how do you do cell culture? How in the world are we gonna change the media on cell cultures in space? How do you keep anything sterile? So we really have been wanting for a long time to understand cellular physiology in the microgravity environment for, for all these reasons that I listed before. We wanted to study cardiomyocyte function and cell contractility in microgravity, but we'd never done long-term cell culture in space. In 20 years of operating the International Space Station, we had not been able to do long-term cell culture. Cell culture is offering us this entirely new area of study in microgravity. But start with how are we gonna do this impossible, impossible problem? What, what are the basics? So I can't use standard 70% ethanol to spray down my, my hood. It's a fire hazard in a spacecraft. Also, it's a spray and we're gonna have a whole bunch of droplets suspended. So again, you know, the, the ways that gravity affects us in the lab you don't even think about. We had no facilities on board the International Space Station for cell culture because this task seemed so impossible. We had not built them. So we threw logic out the window, assumed we could get a functioning experimental setup, and solved the problem backwards. We repurposed a physical science glove box and added BSL floor gloves that were flexible enough for an operator using a material out of a, a material that we can decontaminate. And I'm gonna give you three guesses as to who thought about this idea. And anybody, uh, my BSL four friends out there, I feel like you're with me here. So we tested these non-flammable disinfectants and we developed methods of sterile techniques that we could adapt to microgravity with everything inside the hood floating. It's a, it's a really interesting problem for sterilization. We took this standard six well culture dish, uh, we added a gas permeable membrane for CO2 exchange and a lure lock port to change the media with a syringe. We certified and flew a COTS microscope and a CO2 incubator. We designed cell culture chambers and the outer housing with structural support so that these could survive launch loads. You can't put a standard six well plate on top of a rocket and expect it to arrive okay in space. So we, we loaded this up, we got our cells. These are some extremely lucky cells. They're gonna get a trip uh, on orbit and we loaded them onto a cargo vehicle and launched them uh, out of Cape Canaveral at Kennedy. We launched the first live cells destined for long-term cell culture in space. I managed to keep them alive for 30 days without contamination. I, I have never been, I have never been so nervous about changing the media before in a cell culture experiment, right? My students used to make fun of me because when you're out of the lab for a little while, like maybe your sterile technique's not so good. They're like, oh God, Kate's coming into the cell culture room. So I get on board and I've got, I've got these cells and there is no throwing out the dish and getting some new ones when they've launched into space. We collected RNA, uh, we fixed the cells at various time points, we captured video microscopy uh, at various time points through the experiment, and it was a success. Uh, the cells returned to Earth in this fireball of plasma, they landed off the coast of California, they're picked up in a ship, uh, driven up to the lab at Stanford for further characterization. And uh, we followed up that experiment with multiple different cell types. So this is the follow-on experiment, and here we're using chambers. Uh, we wanted to now look at engineering a complex tissue. And so we used multiple different cell types to create engineered heart tissue, suspended this between two flexible posts, and now we're in that area where we can look at this multiple tissue 
uh, multiple cellular tissue and start building up these complex and delicate structures. This allows us to study tissue architecture. Uh, we can study vascularization in the future. We can study tissue interaction in suspension. So receipts, right? Publications or it doesn't count. Uh, we, did, we did manage to uh, publish our first set of experiments and the rest of it is in work. So one of our next drivers of innovation was the push to miniaturize and simplify equipment. When I got to NASA in 2009, I asked some very naive questions like, what are our laboratory benchtop capabilities in space? How do we do molecular biology experiments extraterrestrially? And I found that the paradigm was you can't do an experiment in space unless it's designed in an enclosed module that is ridiculously expensive, takes at least 10 years to develop, and gives little to no flexibility to change your experimental conditions. And by the way, we can't pipette in space. Okay, this is gonna be a little rough for the biologist. So I ignored that paradigm which as a naive baby astronaut, you've got some leeway. It seems fairly acceptable because baby astronauts don't know anything anyway. So we worked with a team of similarly stubborn bench scientists to figure out how we could miniaturize, simplify, and adapt a standard benchtop experiment to the microgravity environment. I flew pipettes and plastic wear in my psychological support kit on my first mission. I'm a scientist. Pipetting brings me joy. Therefore, it's psychological support on a long duration mission, and my flight surgeons agree. <laughs> so we just did the experiment. We invented some extremely high-tech uh, pipette holders. You can see here, this is duct tape. Uh, we had a drink bag of water, food coloring, and we just started acting like ISS was a normal bench that happened to be zipping along at 17,500 miles an hour in the vacuum of space. I wanted to see what worked and what failed. So we demonstrated the 384 well plates, 96 well plates, conical tubes, Eppendorf tubes. Basically, I ordered the entire Thermo Fisher catalog and flew it to space. <laughs> and then we recorded this video evidence. And this was a great way to do things because if it fails, who cares? It was my psych support kit. <laughs> Free. Uh, there's a lot of things that we do in space that are not your tradi traditional lab bench equipment. There's a lot of MacGyvering that has to happen when you are completely separate from our Earth-based environment. But this makes science fun. So the focus on simplification, miniaturization, and adapting existing tools and lab techniques to this new environment has really helped us usher in an era of exponentially increasing scientific output. Programmatically, we began flying a lot more things at risk. If the experiment is small, portable, and cheap, it's not that rack-sized 10-year developmental program, then we can take risks that it won't work. It's now a kilogram of bench supplies. It's not hardware that took a decade to build with a contract that size that went along with it. So we can prototype, we can launch an experiment, we observe, iterate, fly it again. We are testing in the field these days. We've continued this new arena of space science through our whole biomedical portfolio. So the pipettes you saw are no longer Kate's psych support equipment. Um, I signed over the hardware to the United States National Aeronautics and Space Administration. I did not get paid for this, and it got part numbers. It's officially part of the International Space Station uh, laboratory equipment. One of the things that we started to be able to do with this technique is uh, collaborate with outside partners that have bench-ready experiments that are not spaceflight-ready experiments uh, and move these two fields together. So there's a series of collaborative experiments between NIH, NCATS, and the ISS National Lab on board the space station. And this is leveraging the tissue engineering and the microfabrication advances to create tissue and organ on chip platforms. And, and we talk a lot about this here, and I'm really excited to see some of the advances that DOD uh, is, is doing in this area. So these platforms can mimic the human physiology in the extreme environment of space. Why do we want to study this? Um, some of the health concerns that are very similar to aging, such as muscle degeneration, osteoporosis, reduced cardiopulmonary function, and immune deficiency are really well documented in space. It's also been observed that these conditions are reversible when the astronauts return to Earth. 
And so this is a great system for us to understand the role of microgravity on human health and disease, and hopefully translate some of those findings to help improve human health on Earth. So our goal now is to rapidly evolve this tissue chip technology through miniaturization and automation of the chips when they're deployed to ISS. Spaceflight, again, can be a fortune function for miniaturization. Because thank you, Apollo, for my smartphone, right? There's, there's ways that our extreme environments drive us to make things be field deployable. The entire field of biology has been undergoing a revolution in th high throughput data collection and analysis. So I'd like a show of hands, please. How many of you in your scientific careers have poured polyacrylamide gels and ran P32 labeled DNA for sequencing? Show of hands. Oh my god, I love it. All right, the ones that didn't raise your hands, we are going to tell all you young whippersnappers about it at lunch. <laughs> this is how we used to sequence DNA. So this ability to rapidly sequence vast amounts of genomic material identifies a, you know, it just opens this world to us that we couldn't do before. This is going to underlie a lot of the experiments that we want to do in space. So rather than building our own from scratch, we looked at the market and we identified a small, portable, ruggedized sequencer from Oxford Nanopore. We cannot fly something to space that's got lasers that need to be aligned and are relying on the, a huge benchtop experiment uh, that's going to look at, at fluorescence. This is, that kind of sequencing is not compatible with our space environment. And so this, uh, this photo is actually from the first DNA sequencing experiment done in space in 2016. Um, I was lucky enough to, to be able to be there and, and to work on the development of this experiment all the way through. And so we demonstrated this technology for monitoring cellular experiments, human health on board, uh, astronaut health for exploration, and the microbial environment on board a spacecraft for long duration exploration class missions. By the end of this mission, we'd sequenced two billion base pairs, and I was working on writing the manuscript for my crew quarters. <laughs> I don't know if it's the first paper ever written in space, but it was a pretty cool experience. So we've subsequently developed methods from going uh, from the microbial swabs through verifiable sequences for pathogen identification. Most recently, during my 2021 mission, we started multiplexing for higher throughput data generation. You guys wonder why I was messing with those 384 well plates in the previous video. So the next challenge was very high density spatial temporal collection for metagenomic genomic analysis. So instead of doing one or two swabs, we want to map the entire International Space Station at a spatial and a temporal level. Why are we doing this? We are going to be sending spacecraft for two and a half years to Mars with no mid-mission return capability. We don't have a good characterization of the microbiome inside that spacecraft. We don't know what makes a healthy microbiome in the built environment in space. Is the microbiome stable? What conditions perturb it? Do we start to lose diversity during a long duration mission? Are we at risk for generating a very unhealthy environment? a year and a half on the way to the Mars, uh, Mars mission, and could we be generating microbes with adverse consequences for human health? We've got microbes that have been there years long in a closed environment with radiation, microgravity, and human immune dysfunction. This is not an awesome recipe at this point. So to start studying this, we really need to start mapping the microbiomes of our spacecraft. We need to do it yesterday. So we started this high-density, uh, high-dimensional microbial mapping of the interior of the ISS. Uh, it was 1,000 dual swab samples collected from 800 different locations within the space station. Uh, guess who volunteered? Yours truly. I put on my headphones. I got 60s rock anthems playlist queued up on Spotify, and I got in the zone. I got in the flow for this 1,000 sample collection. So these samples were collected, returned to Earth, and they're currently undergoing the whole genome uh, shotgun sequencing. Uh, we're going to do metabolic, uh, metagenomic, and proteomic analysis on these. So the market had done uh, most of the work for us in developing a portable and robust product for, for this sequencer that's the, that's the end state of things like our microbial sampling and our human health. We just needed to adapt that equipment to our situation. 
We needed to develop the processes and the protocols that would allow us to use this platform in microgravity. Uh, but we are not developing the platform from scratch every time. I, I think DOD and DIRTA really understands this lesson, and this is a driver of innovation and technological change. Uh, by selecting a commercially available device, which was not customized to our niche area, we've now opened up the ability to sequence DNA and RNA in space, and we did this on the immediate time horizon. We can use commercial kits and reagents. We can create our own primaries and libraries. In our specialized area of science and technology, we sometimes try to design and build a custom product for our needs. And I, I know that you guys have all seen this. Uh, we have to build, some, we're, we're doing specialized science. We need to build a specialized device for the specialized science. So NASA is an incredible agency. We are amazing at rocket science, orbital mechanics, launching people into outer space. However, when we try to design a smartwatch for physiology monitoring of astronauts, it was like wearing an MP3 device from 2002 on your wrist. <laughs> Sometimes it's really good that we stick to rocket science and let Apple and Fitbit design the smartwatch. So we are always going to need to adapt these platforms, and we're going to need to integrate them into our solution environment. But if we can harness the forces of the commercial marketplace and American ingenuity, we can turbocharge that development cycle. Wherever I can grab a COTS product and then modify it a little bit for spaceflight, I've now sped up my development cycle by five years. So one of the things that we've been uh, thinking about in terms of efficiency and innovation across our programs is interoperability in remote environments. As we're developing, testing, and fielding all these technologies, I kept thinking about my time in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So together with a small team of USAMRID researchers, we got dropped off uh, 1,500 kilometers into the interior of the DRC we were looking to collect primary virus samples and immune samples uh, from monkeypox outbreaks, uh, which was, back then, it was one of the very few places that you would have naturally occurring human pox virus infection. So the kinds of uh, the technology that we've been developing for the International Space Station, which is one of the most high-tech places that humans have built and done science, would have actually been perfect in this remote environment. So designing platforms for the most austere conditions often leads us to these concepts of miniaturization, simplification, reduction on reliance of specialized kits, reduction on reliance on power that's provided continuously, internet connection, data transmission. The further you go into the field, the harder it becomes, but it also drives our innovation. So when we land on a planetary surface for the first time, and for everybody, in case you are wondering, we are going. This is a good time to be alive. We are going to bring with us the technology and instrumentation to collect samples, analyze biological and environmental processes, map the terrain of a foreign planetary body, and search for life. And these are going to be the kinds of tools which you and the warfighter will recognize. What we can put in the hands of an explorer, you can put in the hands of a warfighter, and vice versa. So we use this interoperability within NASA to move between missions. We're transitioning our technology from use in low Earth orbit to the current technology we're starting to field for lunar exploration and to far future of deep space exploration. Mars and a combat zone may seem literally worlds apart, but the characteristics of these environments overlap in many ways. So I'm going to challenge us in this whole of government approach to work on information and technology exchange, to work on interoperability across government agencies, for this extreme environment, we can learn a lot from each other. So as a lot of the other speakers have discussed, we are facing challenges across all industries. The pace of technological change is accelerating. This rapidly changing world requires a focus on efficiency of tech dev, pushing down the cost of technologies so we can rapidly adopt widespread access, and anticipation of future technologies and threats. While the rate of change is ever increasing, sadly, my mental processing speed is not, maybe slowing down as I get older. So we do not have a pill like in Limitless. You guys have all seen this movie, right? And also, would you really take it? Like, as Limitless moves into the matrix, I don't know. Do I want to speed up my mental processing speed? But 
we're humans. We, we've kind of set with our hardware and our software here. So how do we adapt how rapidly we're able to learn? These are things like network systems, AI and machine learning, uh, but, but we need this understanding of how we integrate that piece with the human. We need to make sure the human comes along with the ride. And then finally, our ever-present TRL 4 to 6 technology valley of death that we love. So we're going to need to develop and respond to technologies ever more rapidly. How do we bridge this divide, and how do we accelerate the translation across it? So I've talked at modernization uh, and innovation at NASA internally, and I'd like to turn to some ideas for how we can harness American ingenuity. We've got resources uh, in our industrial base. We've got commercial enterprise. We've got best in the world academic system. How do we harness all of that to accelerate progress on all fronts of science and technology? So uh, one of the things that, that we can do is connect NASA to some of these engines of innovation in the academic and the commercial sector. I know when operators start talking about acquisitions, it makes the real professional squirm. But I'm going to discuss how we're doing something very interesting in changing the contracting philosophy for NASA. One approach to these challenges is reimagining acquisitions. We can talk about the rate at which government can change with, with uh, acquisitions and contracts. But I'm still over here, and I'm writing my draft RFP for that risk-mounted MP3 player. I can't get to it quite yet. So rather than the government directing and owning everything, we're working to partner with companies that are often more likely to be on the bleeding edge of innovation. In the last decade, NASA has been moving from a cost plus structure where the government owns the hardware to firm fixed price and to where we're buying services. This has not been without road bumps. Uh, this really has been a decade long process. But some deliberate decisions to stimulate a low earth orbit economy have proven transformational for the speed of technological innovation at NASA. So for example, we partnered with SpaceX um, starting about a decade ago. We invested very heavily in development of cargo and subsequently crew launch systems. That has pushed down the cost of launches. It's dramatically increased the number of launches per year. And then it's made these innovations available to the entire space sector. So that's NASA, but it's also commercial launches, military payloads, all of our future deep space exploration missions. So this idea of new space companies, um, as with this kind of high tech idea, embodies this ethos of move fast and break things. For SpaceX, it's test fast and blow things up. But commercial space industry moves a lot faster than the most nimble of government agencies. We can let our commercial partners innovate. Well, as a government agency, we provide the history, the experience, the safety backstop. The goal is more launch, less boom. Uh, we can provide all of those things to our partners. And together, we can move a lot faster than we would have been able to in the old model. So industry has become this collaborative partner. We still write requirements. We use these requirements for verification and validation and for hardware acceptance. But we do not dictate what is built and how it is built, as we used to in the shuttle and the ISS construction days. OK, vacation photo. This is, this is like the fun part. When you go to space, like you got to show your vacation photos. So that's me bolting on the new module to the front of the space station, um, generally trying not to die, as you do on a spacewalk. Uh, full disclosure, I'm the astronaut office uh, spacesuit robotics and lunar surface operations lead. Um, so I like talking about spacesuits a lot. <laughs> we, can, we can chat at lunch. Um, but spacesuits, uh, I cannot sufficiently urgently, sufficiently convey the urgency of our need for updated hardware. Spacesuits are among the most bespoke and antiquated pieces of spaceflight hardware. We have 18 uh, extravehicular uh, units that were manufactured starting in 1979 through 2002. This is during the shuttle era. Of these, only 11 spacesuits remain, four of which are the only operationally certified for flight units. These are the only ones uh, ready at any given time. So there's two people that do a spacewalk, the backup suit, and the one we cannibalize for hardware to replace whatever's broken and needed fixing. All right, this is a 40-year-old suit. 
I was on the mishap board for one of our suit issues and we found parts that were manufactured before most of the mishap board was born. This is where we are. So this is an area that's really crying out for innovation and technology update for this century. Uh, at this point, the suits are quite literally being held together with bailing wire. Duct tape, which is my other spaceflight engineering solution, is not certified for use in vacuum at minus 200 degrees. I checked. So we, I, I am not kidding about this. We have helmet lights here that are no longer able to be attached to the suit. They are falling off the suit. We cannot re-engineer our way out of this. And so we have taken bailing wire and we are using that to hold the helmet lights onto the spacesuit. We need zoo suits. So starting with a commercial crew and then going on through lunar surface uh, exploration with Artemis and deep space exploration, we're building this model of service contracts. So the old suits, uh, the government owned the hardware, we designed the hardware, we had a contractor build it, uh, but we were in on every facet of that process. These days, we are gonna let the contractors innovate and we are gonna buy the services. So we recently let uh, a $3.5 billion contract for our next generation spacesuits. This will cover ISS, lunar, and planetary exploration. So it's an IDIQ contact, contract and it's got firm fixed price task orders. This is really different from our cost plus model of the shuttle days. Industry is accelerating this pace of development. They're using rapid prototyping cycles. They are advancing materials and life support. They're identifying efficiencies as they aim for a broader customer base. It's a really different uh, set of, of problems and solutions when you are an industry, private industry partner, and you want to build a broad commercial base versus you have, uh, you have government as your customer and that is, the only, that is the only agency that you can sell your services to. So we're really leaning hard on our commercial partners to identify design solutions which are gonna be uh, incorporating all of this, uh, this cutting edge design. We're buying the development and the sustaining services for spacesuits. We want a commercial market for this hardware. We don't want the trickle of government purchasing. In our new model, industry maintains ownerships of the designs and they can use this in their commercial endeavors. So this can be used for space tourism, which we make fun of, but it's here and, and it can bring a lot of money into our industry. Academic institutions, commercial scientific investigations, commercial lunar mining endeavors, there are a lot of potential customers for spacesuits, whereas previously there was only one. So NASA gets the hardware and the services that we need with the taxpayer dollar then benefiting from the multiplier effect of this expanding sector and the broadened customer base. This is how we are stimulating a burgeoning space economy. So in doing so, we accelerate innovation, we ensure robustness of our supply chain, and we fully utilize the creativity of our American industry. This is the cool stuff we're doing. I can talk about life support systems all day, but we need to get to lunch. Uh, so the next thing I wanna talk about in terms of, of how we're doing our innovation externally is making sure that we keep the focus on the operator. Um, you know, fantastic uh, warfighter panel yesterday, and DITRA certainly knows the value of talking to the warfighter and talking to the operator. We know these operators are the ones that generate the most creative ideas and the novel solutions to the problems because they're out there dealing with this every day. And people above them, we, don't, we can't even find the solutions sometimes because we do not know what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't know the problems that they're encountering. At the management level, we might not even be aware of the full set of problems. A lot of times operators are improvising smart solutions in the field that could be codified and improved. Um, so there's a great book, it's called Talking to Humans, and it helps us, uh, it's really from the, the startup side and, and commercial uh, enterprise, but it's talking about how you can elicit things that you may not know about. Um, so one of the things we're thinking about at NASA is how do startup companies assess their potential customer base? How could we as a government uh, assess our operator, our customer base for what they're doing? So we can use um, operators as fresh eyes uh, on the job. Um, in the astronaut office, we fly T-38s for training, you know, executing a, a maneuver perfectly at 500 miles an hour is very good training. 
for the same thing at 17,500 miles an hour. So this kind of the best that we can get for this uh, high performance, very high stress operational environment. Uh, you know, crew coordination, communication, handling of high performance aircraft. Um, but we've started a program where we ride along with the maintainers. The amount that we have learned uh, as operators of high performance aircraft uh, about our equipment by switching roles, by training alongside uh, these maintenance professionals, and by feeding our observations back into our operational practices as aviators and space flyers is invaluable. Another thing with, with this keeping the operator centered is build devices that can be serviced in the field by non-specialists. You know, we often tell people, hey, you're building your device, you need to astronaut proof it. I just hand it to one of my colleagues and watch them try to break it. So no matter what the engineers tell you about how their box will not break, this is a, this is a law of the universe. It, it will break, it always breaks. You send it to space, it's gonna break. So this is how I start every engineering hardware review. Your thing is gonna break. My question is, how many fasteners do I need to get through in order to get to it and fix it? Is 64 fasteners with a torque tip driver is not my favorite option. So when you leave the planet or when you're operating in any extreme environment, everything must be serviceable in the field. The warfighting domain has similar challenges. So developing hardware that can adapt to changing technology in addition to serviceability is really important. We've talked about this platform approach. Uh, we've had great discussions about how, in this meeting, how we can take a platform technology and update it with new software loads to help us adapt to changing conditions or to use cases. Um, so one example from NASA is we continue to refine our robotic arm to have new capabilities as this technology is developing. So you know, the arm is, is a part that was on the space station, early days of the space station 20 years ago. Um, we have not changed that hardware very much. But then we started doing things like needing to do free flyer capture of a space vehicle once we had SpaceX cargo flying. This was not anticipated pre-Columbia in the shuttle missions. Um, so we've now instrumented this arm with the software abilities, and we've trained the operator to be able to do free flyer capture. We've also implemented interface tools, which we're now using to do tasks outside the ISS instead of the huge risk of doing a human spacewalk. I'm preaching to the choir here, but, but you guys are really understanding of the opportunities that, that autonomy and robotics affords us. And when we build these platforms, we need to think about, we want them to do what we want them to do today, but what are we gonna need them to do in 10 years? All right, are you guys ready for some Kate policy prescriptions? <laughs> uh, this is like acquisitions, so it's really something that operators shouldn't be talking about, but you know, humans shouldn't climb on top of an ICBM, so I'm gonna do it anyway. So, um, you know, how do we harness these science and, and technology innovations that are produced every day using federal funds in our research institutions? Um, as a government employee in both the civilian and the military world, we are acutely aware that we tend to do things through large government contractors and enormous acquisition programs. On the other side, as academics, we're also really aware of how much amazing discoveries is happening every day in labs at research institutions all over the US. We also know that a lot of these academic discoveries are never gonna make that difficult journey to the higher TRLs and to the market and this is a loss. So some universities are trying to innovate solutions to this gap, and there's a lot of really interesting progress on that area, but a lot of universities don't have the wherewithal or the knowledge to do this. Not every university can replicate MIT, and, and this is a great example to look at the Dish Pondé Center there, a Dual Use Ventures Incubator, and the MIT Engine. So they have built, they have built an ecosystem uh, for bridging this gap. But there are so many discoveries of value at institutions that are outside major VC centers that have not put together this kind of process. So how could you help? As a researcher, you can ask your university administration or your office of research how they can help support translational research in your lab. As a commercial entity, you can identify how you could partner with universities to license and transition technology. 
as a defense agency, we can continue to set the example of developing across all of these TRLs and expand this model to other federal agencies. There's a really good reason to keep R&D in universities through the applied and the translational parts. We have a great SBIR model, but if you use this SBIR model and you spin the technology out into a company, now you can no longer access the university equipment and facilities unless the university and the PI are willing to do sponsored research. This can we can do it, but it can create conflict of interest for the PIs and the university. Keeping it in the university, but being able to fund it, allows for a new class of researchers to utilize these existing labs and facilities on university campuses to advance TRL, but also allow for close sharing of information and findings within the original inventor and the PI. Eventually, we do need to get it to the commercial market, and so here we can engage the University Technology Licensing Office for identifying inventions that have the most promise for commercial and defense applications. One thing to keep in mind is when we start pairing these commercial and defense applications, like with the spacesuit services, when we're pairing these for the same technology, it provides more incentives to private industry to pick these up and finance them for the long term. And lastly, my last policy solution for you. <laughs> it's so easy to say it, really hard to implement, right? Um, identifying promising solutions and technologies. So, I know you guys don't get to complete your conference bingo card until I mention AI and machine learning at least twice, so I'm doing it, you're welcome. Uh, so, you know, thinking about this, uh, and there's, you know, these, these solutions are some things that we're starting to do at NASA, and these are also things I think we need to do more of at NASA. So you use AI and machine learning um, to scrape uh, US Patent and Trade Office, grant abstracts, publication databases, trying to proactively identify key technologies that are happening in already in the commercial and the academic sector that have promise for national defense that those patent holders or those NIH grantees have not even thought about their technology being used in the defense sector. Um, we can crowdsource some of these technologies and solutions. So Steve Rader at NASA is doing a lot with open innovation. Uh, and, and they're kind of uh, been a model for NASA about how we can use things like prizes, challenges, uh, and crowdsourcing to help broaden our base and to pull people in that would not normally be in the aerospace sector. If I'm looking at a biotechnology innovation uh, and I'm out in, in the biotech world, those guys have not thought about space. Uh, my guess is a lot of times, unless they're a researcher directly in diagnostics and vaccines, they've probably not thought about biodefense either. So go where these, these innovators are. Go to the universities, talk to the TLOs. Go to where the startups are. Um, places you can find startups are incubators and accelerators, both through university, but, but things like private companies. Um, you know, uh, Illumina has, a, has an in-house accelerator. Uh, you can look for research forums at universities. Um, you can look at conferences and industry forums, trade associations in the biotech sector, uh, that, are, that are doing this kind of biotechnology, but they're outside the biodefense area. So our challenge for the coming decade. With the Artemis missions, NASA is gonna return to the moon, and we're gonna build a sustainable, long-term presence on another planetary body. We are gonna use innovative technologies to explore more of the lunar surface than ever before. We are going back to the moon for scientific discovery, for economic benefits and for inspiration for a new generation of explorers. If you guys have kids, go home at the end of the conference and tell them you got to talk about lunar exploration and watch what this does for our next generation. We wanna maintain American leadership in exploration. We wanna build a global alliance and partnership and we wanna explore deep space for the benefit of all humanity. This is no small task, right? Like, oh wow, this is a big mission. This is, we've got a task to tackle this decade. But so do you. The magnitude of what you are doing is incredible. I know we think about it, but we get lost in our day to day. You are protecting the lives of the warfighter. You are stopping mass destruction. This is existential. I think there's an inflection point in both of our sectors. I cannot wait to see what you and the nation do as we rise to meet these challenges. So thank you very much. 
It has been an absolute pleasure to be here. I want to thank some of the folks involved in the work. And uh, I have to, do have to put a plug in uh, for the 75th Innovation Command. So um, when you come back from space, you kind of need this like, well, what am I going to do in the next phase of my life? Um, and last time I came back, I tried a, an SES job for a little while. Uh, <laughs> So this, this time I came back and I'm like, well, you know, what am, what am I going to do? Um, so I decided to join the Army. Very, very ancient joining the Army uh, at this stage of life. But it's something that I've been wanting to do for a while. I'd, I'd really been wanting to serve. And um, I missed biodefense, and I wanted to get back to it. And so I got so lucky to end up in the 75th Innovation Command. Um, and so this is under Army Futures Command. And it has a, a, a really interesting mission to use the Army Reserve uh, in a different way, that basically take folks that have specialized skills in their civilian jobs and then leverage that uh, for defense purposes. So we have a lot of portfolios, you know, AI, machine learning, autonomy, cyber, energy, materials, space, medical, and synthetic biology. And so I joined this, everybody said, okay, we're going to space. No, I was going to synthetic biology. Um, so I, I've been really fortunate to work with this group. Um, and, and this is an amazing capability that can actually support some of the things that you're doing. So if anybody wants to talk a little bit more about the Innovation Command, come, come find me at lunch. Thank you.